Amen. I believe that, don't you? Oh, let's try that again. I believe that, don't you? Yes. Oh, well, that's, that's a little better. That's a little better. Well, good morning, everyone. The kids are heading out to Kids Church. Um, if you feel like a kid, you can go join them. Yeah, I know. Well, it's good to see you this morning. And most of you know me, but some of you don't. Um, my name is uh, Ken Stanford, and I'm the district superintendent for the New England District. And I have the privilege of working with your church leadership team and, and uh, with you as a congregation uh, in these days of pastoral transition. And so usually on the first Sunday of the, uh, after the previous pastor has had their final Sunday, I usually come in just to say God's in control. Uh, it's his church. We sang some wonderful music this morning. You know, this worship team is incredible. You know that? Yeah. You know, when we were singing, uh, Emmanuel, there's a part where all the music cuts out, and that's called a cappella, right? I know a little bit about, not much, but a little bit. But did you hear them hit those notes? I mean, they just blasted them. I mean, they all had those. I just stopped singing because I make a joyful noise. So, that, so I just stopped singing and listened to it. It was incredible. Right there. I mean, I could have gone home and said, I've come to church, Right? So you're all dismissed. I'm just kidding. I really am. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it's a, a blessing to, to be with you this morning. I just want to talk to you just for a few moments about the, uh, the process that lies ahead. So I bring you greetings from the district and, and the 90-something churches, and uh, we're all over the place and all over New England, and we even have a church in Bermuda that's part of our district. That's a that's a cool thing, so we're going there sometime in January. I don't know when, but... So my responsibility, as I mentioned, is to journey with you. Uh, you have an incredible staff. You really do. You have a great staff, and I know you're praying for them, and uh, they're doing great. And, they're, you know, they're picking up pieces. They're jumping in there and, and helping out, and you have a great church board, a great leadership team, and they're working. You have a great worship team. I know that's not the only one that does that. And, and everyone's involved. And, and it's just great. This is a great place to be. It really is. Amen. Amen. And it belongs to him. It belongs to the Lord. So, and then you heard uh, announced that on January 26th, um, there'll be an interim pastor. His name is Reverend Dr. Gary Sivright. And he'll be kind of coming in as an interim. And, and the church has joined in with new church specialties through their uh, tips, tempor uh, temporary interim pastoral services. I have to remember that. And so he'll be coming in, and there's a six-month covenant with him, and that can be extended every 60 days as, as we get in that process. But he'll be coming. He's a wonderful communicator. Um, he's a great leader, development of leaders. And, and he and his wife, Dala, there's just a, a wonderful team. And you will enjoy uh, their ministry together and, and be a part of that. So that's very exciting. I'll wasn't sure that was going to happen, but God took care of that, and so that's very exciting. Next week, uh, next Sunday, Pastor John Nielsen will be preaching. The Sunday after that, uh, Pastor Andrea will be preaching, so you won't have to hear me three Sundays. You just hear me today, and, and, uh, and they'll be sharing, because so, I have other places to travel. And so uh, we're working on a great plan. So uh, as the church board meets, uh, pretty soon uh, you'll be asked to participate in an assessment. I know we had that a couple of years ago, so it won't be as involved as that, uh, but it's a kind of a renewed version of that where we want you to be involved and, and participate in that. And then from the assessment, a grid or a profile will be formed of the congregation and, and the pastor that we are looking for that with God's help, and that will form kind of a grid or a lens uh, by which we'll look at resumes and do interviews, whether they're by a phone or by uh, Zoom video conference call. And then uh, eventually uh, the church board uh, will uh, recommend or nominate is the official term uh, from the manual to you, the congregation, the person that they have felt uh, would be, uh, would be the, uh, the next lead pastor uh, for this congregation. They'll announce a time of meet and greet where uh, they'll be here for the weekend and it'll be a Q and A time, conversations, all sorts of things. And then on Sunday, uh, that particular candidate will, will preach in both services and be involved in that. And then following that, uh, you'll have an opportunity, if you're a member of the church, 
and you're age 15 years of age or older on that particular day that we vote, you'll have an opportunity to vote yes or to vote no. If there's a two-thirds favorable vote of that, uh, then uh, the candidate will be notified and they have up to 15 days uh, to give a response. So, I mean, that's a lot of information. That's not happening today. That's not happening next week. That's not even going to happen in January. That's just kind of a 30,000-foot view of this process that we'll be engaged in. And we'll keep you informed all along the way and, and keep you on top of information. And so uh, there'll be a time and when you'll be encouraged to, uh, to let uh, the church board secretary know um, of names, potential names or resumes that you would like for me to contact in that process. So that'll be made clear to you as well. So that's not going to all happen at once. But I just wanted to share you a little bit about the information. We don't kind of do this willy-nilly. Uh, I don't even know if that's a phrase anymore. We just kind of, we do it as, as God leads and God helps us. So uh, it's going to be an incredible journey. And so uh, we just encourage you to be involved and to be engaged. So this morning, I want to share with you uh, three encouragements uh, while we're engaged in this process. I have a lot more than three, but I'm just going to share uh, three this morning. I love the reading uh, that Megan read this, uh, this week, uh, this morning from the lectionary uh, in Ephesians about God's plan and God putting things together. And there are some incredible readings in the lectionary. The gospel reading uh, for this morning is from John chapter 1. And there's a great verse in there too, and I'm going to refer to that uh, in a minute. Um, but part of my scripture reading plan uh, was to read uh, the gospel of John. I think it was... Um, I think it was either Christmas the 25th or the 26th. I can't remember which, uh, which day it was, but it was to read John 1. And there's a verse that stood out to me, and I want to read that to you. It's verse number 10 of John chapter 1. So let me, uh, let me get there, and, and I'll read it to you. It's, it's a great verse. You know, the whole, the whole first chapter of John, especially those first 18 verses, you could do a bazillion messages on that. That's just some powerful verses there. But verse number 10 says, He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, uh, the world did not recognize him. And that's, that's an that's a incredible verse that stood out to me. So I read it in a different translation, and this is what uh, the translation that I wrote in my, uh, sorry, I'm trying to get my head together here. I wrote in my scriptural journal uh, this particular translation. Uh, he entered into the very world he created, yet the world was unaware. He entered into the very world that he created, yet the world was unaware. And I started thinking, how could they be unaware of the very world that God created? How could we be unaware of those kinds of things and, and, and awareness? And that's just an interesting word. So I started thinking about being how, how we can be unaware of things. Um, if you ever had to buy a new car, anybody ever had to buy a new car? So, so you do research, right? You do research and, and you kind of look, you know, you, you, there's a color that you like and a particular brand that you like and you start thinking of, of you know the miles per gallon and or maybe you think of the speed instead but you start thinking of these kinds of things and and you check the you know dealerships out to find the best price and so you look around and look around and and then you engage with the salesperson and and they say well they need to talk to their boss so their boss comes and you engage with them and then they say they need to talk to the big boss and so the big boss comes and you talk to them finally hopefully you get to the price that you want you jump in the car and you know when it's ready and and off you go and you start driving the car and then all of a sudden all of a sudden you start seeing other cars or other people driving cars that's exactly like yours do you ever notice that I mean, you think that you, you know, this is great and you've never seen a car like this before and at least that's what you're thinking. But then you start driving around and you see, oh, this, and it's, it's almost like 15,000 people have waited for you to post it on social media that this is the car you're going to get. And they all say, oh, if you're going to get that car, I'm going to get it too. Well, we know that's not the case. It's just that now we become aware, we become uh, more sensitive of those kinds of things. And whenever I started a new pastorate, I would get an eight and a half, uh, uh, eight and a half by 11 size 
a pad of paper and start jotting down some things that I noticed because, well, this needs to be worked on, this needs to, because I knew that within 30 days, I'd probably forget and I just get used to seeing what I'm seeing. And so, so we need to have an awareness and, and, um, and those kinds of things. So this passage of scripture, this verse, where he entered into the very world he created, yet the world was unaware, except there were a couple of people that were totally aware. And I want us to look at that passage just for a moment. It's in Luke chapter 2. So if you take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 2, the two names that I'm thinking of is Simeon and Anna. Simeon and Anna. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse number 22. I'm getting to those three points. Uh, Once I get there, I'll go. You'll see. In Luke chapter 2, verse 22, when the time of their purification according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. And there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting As that word waiting. We're going to talk about waiting. He was waiting. And the word really means he was not just waiting, but he was in expectation. He was ready to receive. So there's an expectation there. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah, or Christ, the Anointed One. Moved by the Spirit. So there's the spirits listed three different times there in those verses. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God and said, Sovereign Lord, as you have now promised, you you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. It's interesting. I mean, Simeon, I mean, Jesus didn't have any clothes on him that said, I am the Messiah, or, you know, there was nothing on the back of his diapers that said, I am the Messiah. I mean, and Mary or Joseph, they didn't have any T-shirts that pointed to, hey, the Messiah is with us. There was none of that stuff. And there must have been other babies. There must have been a lot of commotion there. How did Simeon know? How did he know that this was the Messiah? And how did he even know the Messiah was going to be a baby? I mean, how does that stuff happen? You would think, I would think, because they were looking for the Messiah would be the king, would conquer all the enemies. I would think that they would be thinking that this person's going to come on a horse and is going to, you know, make make all sorts of things and, and take control for us. And here Jesus comes, the Messiah comes as a baby. I mean, it's like 40 days old by the time Mary and Joseph got there for this time. And Simeon knew. Ah, How did he know that? How was he so aware of that kind of information? And he comes up, and we don't read of Mary and Joseph saying, hey, back off, you know. I mean, he just comes up, and he takes this baby in his arms and starts blessing them. Well, the mother and father called the cops and said, hey, do you see what this guy is doing? No, the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Well, that's not all to the story. There was a prophetess named Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old and she had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then she was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting, praying, coming up to them at that very moment, totally aware, on that very moment. She gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. This is, uh, it was just, an incredible story. I, I just marvel at the awareness of Simeon and Anna to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. 
We don't read of an angel coming down and talking to them. We don't even see Gabriel in this part of the story. We don't know if they had dreams like Joseph had. I mean, we don't see any of that. We don't read of any star or any kind of a celestial thing that guided them like, like was guided of the Magi. But they just knew. How could they be so aware that this was the Messiah? It's, I'm going to say it's simple, but it's not simple. But it's very simple. It was the work of the Spirit. Just like the work of the Spirit is involved in the life and community of this very congregation. So during this time of pastoral transition and interim, I want to share with you, now I'm going to get to the three encouragements. Are you ready? Three encouragements uh, for you and I to become aware so it could be said of us that we would be aware. Encouragement number one. Even if it doesn't seem like God is at work, he's at work, right? Even if it doesn't seem like God is at work, he is at work. I keep backing up here and I get my tan worked on with the lights. I mean, even if you're struggling with things, even if you're struggling with stuff or wondering, is God still at work? Hey, he's at work. You may be here this morning and you might be thinking, how can God be at work in this? I'm telling you, he is at work. So I want to encourage you in that. God is at, this is his church. I mean, I know it has the church of the Nazarene on it, and I know, but it's not, uh, no, I have to be careful how I say this. It doesn't belong to the church of the Nazarene. I mean, it kind of does belong to the church, but it doesn't belong to the church of the Nazarene. It's his church, amen? And he takes care of it. We belong to him. Now, it doesn't mean we do whatever we want. I mean, we're kind of in that we're kind of in that structure. But even if it doesn't seem that God is at work, he is at work. How did Simeon know other than he's been waiting for a long time? The word wait there, the background or the context of that word seems to be like he was waiting a long time. I mean, he hadn't been waiting for a half an hour or two weeks or a month. It appears from the context that he's been waiting for a long time. Well, They're all waiting for a long time. In the city of Quincy, there are cross crosswalks. Do you ever see them? And on the pole where the crosswalks are, there's a button that you push, right? And what does the button say? Wait, 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 right, wait, wait, wait. I have this thing. I, I like to walk in the city. So if I'm with Jackie, and she doesn't like this so much, but I'll, I'll go to the button and I'll go, wait, wait, wait. Wait, you should try it. I mean, if people around, they'll think you're amazing. They'll just say, hey, look at this guy, come. You can put a hat out, get some money. I mean, you know, wait, 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 wait. It's great. I, I went, so I was thinking, I shared this in the first service. I wonder who it was that recorded that word, wait. You know, was it a computer program or was it a person? So let me ask you. If you were asked to design a voice for the word wait on those crosswalks, what kind of a voice would you use? Think about that. If you were to, if you were to, if you were to you know, if that was your job, what kind of a voice would you use when, that, when you, someone pushed that button and you hear the word wait? What kind of a voice would you use, all right? Are you ready? All right, tell someone next to you. What kind of a voice? Go ahead, tell them. Tell the person next to you. What would it be? Red, what would it be? Yeah, right? I mean, who's to say it has to be that voice, right? Wait, wait, wait. See, now, see, this is, this is part of the strategy. Now when you do the crosswalk and you push that button, you're going to think of the message this morning. Wait, wait, wait. God was already at work while Simeon was waiting. God was already at work. I mean, he had already begun the work with Zechariah and Elizabeth. He had already begun talking to Mary and to Joseph through Gabriel. I mean, he was already working on the Magi who had been looking for centuries about this celestial... Where does that all come from? That's a long story, but where does that all come from? They were, God was already at work. You know, 
part of our theological foundation is, is Wesleyan. And, and as Wesleyans, we believe that God, this provenient grace of God, which means God is at work all around us. Before you became a follower of Jesus Christ, God was already at work in your life through provenient grace, trying to, there's an old word called wooing, try to woo you to his, himself. And, and so God was already at work in provenient. So we believe that God is at work all around us. He's at work all around us even now. He's at work in our schools. He's at work in our neighborhood. He's even at work in circumstances that are beyond our control. And we've run into those this week. There's some world global circumstances that's so far out of our control. And God's even at work in those kinds of circumstances. God's at work through his spirit. God's already at work working with your staff. God's already at work working in the lives of your church board. God's already at work working through the Gary and, and Dalla Sivrite. God's already at work working through the lives of people who may be considered or who may be praying about becoming the next lead pastor of this church. God is already at work in their hearts and in their lives. I believe that, don't you? That's the first encouragement. How many do I have? Three, all right, number two. I'm just trying to see if you're paying attention. <laughs> Encouragement number two. In this time of transition and interim, deepen your sensitivity to the movement of the Spirit. I want to encourage you to deepen your sensitivity to the movement of His Spirit. In this passage this morning of Luke chapter 2, in verse number 25, we read that Simeon was waiting. And I mentioned earlier, the word waiting means to, ready, to be ready to receive, to anticipate the deep work of the Spirit. Um, how many of you enjoy waiting? I have an experiment for you to try uh, this week. Are you ready? When you come to a light and it turns red, obviously you stop, right? So when the light turns green, just sit there. All right, don't move. Just, just sit there, right? And just start counting, you know, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, and see how long it takes before the person behind you starts beeping or bumps you or does something else. Now, I don't know how they've done this research, but there's been research on this, research on everything, but there's been research done about this that says that the average time that's before someone will beat their horn is under four seconds. I think it's 3.7. I don't know how they get that. They didn't get that from Quincy, that much I do know. I mean, I mean, Quincy, I mean, here. So I was waiting. The light hadn't even turned yet. I mean, it was getting real. All of a sudden, someone's beeping right behind me. I looked to see if it was one of the Wollaston teens, but it wasn't. It wasn't. I mean, it, some of them just already starting to beep. I'm thinking, dude, the light hasn't even changed yet. God bless you. But the light hasn't even changed yet. We, we don't like to wait. It's difficult uh, to wait. But Simeon was waiting. And he had the discipline to spend time waiting. I, I talked to you about uh, waiting takes discipline and encouraging you. And part of this is in deepening your sensitivity to the movement of the spirit is to spend time in the word, to spend time in prayer. Be alert to his promptings. Be attentive to his promptings. Uh, Simeon and Anna, they deepened their walk with God. They, they weren't dependent upon the circumstances. Uh, what they were dependent upon was uh, the, the character of God in those circumstances. There's, um, there's I, uh, several years ago, I was reading a book about uh, a man named Frank Lauerbach, L-A-U-B-A-C-H. Um, and, and he was considered the father of the modern literacy movement. He was an educator. He was a missionary, and he felt he had a he had a he started a program called Each One Teach One. He started that, and so he felt that if people could become literate, if they could read and and write, that they could get themselves out of some difficult situation. In fact, he would talk about literacy and connect literacy with world peace, and and so in the 30s. Uh, 1930s, he was writing a, in his journal because in this process, he was trying to fi find a way that he could pay attention to the promptings of the Spirit 100% of each day. 
So he began to work on that. So he, he, he would pray and he said, Lord, you know, I want to I wanna be sensitive to the leadership of your spirit. So at the end of his journal, at the end of the day, he would write down, you know, uh, today I, I, I was sensitive to the Lord 70% of the time. And the next day I was sensitive to the Lord 65, I don't know how he would keep track of that stuff, but he's an educator and educators like to keep track of those kinds of things. And, and one day it was like 20% and he said, I've got to try harder the next day. And so this is what he would try to do. And so he tried in his writings, he would try to encourage every Christian to be uh, sensitive to the, uh, let me just, to be fully aware of God uh, for at least one second at, of every minute of the day. That was, that was his goal. And, and so he would talk about how he could do that. Uh, he, began to, uh, he began to pray for people. And in his journals and in his books, he would relate stories of how he would be praying for people. And he, he I mean, he wouldn't stand up and, you know, I, I'm praying. Or he'd, he'd be, you know, back in those days, it wasn't easy to travel around. So if it was a train, he was on one seat and there was, a person was on the other seat. You know, they seat face each other. And he would talk about praying. Like one time he was praying for this lady. He didn't know the name of the lady. He was just praying for this lady. He would, I mean, he didn't close his eyes. He didn't open his Bible. This, she would have no idea that he was praying for her, but he was praying for her. And, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, she says to him, now listen, I am not going to follow Jesus Christ because you want me to. I mean, out of the blue. I mean, this is, what, this is the stuff he wrote. So he would write about these things that as he was praying for people, he became sensitive to other people and some of the other things that were going on. It, I mean, it, it, it was amazing. And, and so, and so he, he talked about that and as, um, as an experiment of prayer. So I thought, you know, I think I'll try that. So I have a cardiologist. Anybody have a cardiologist? Yeah, some of you do. The younger ones, what's a cardiologist? Uh, so I had some heart issues several years ago, and I, well, it's not that way anymore, but I used to be the youngest, uh, the youngest patient in the cardiologist's office. Isn't that impressive? Yeah, I thought so. It impressed me too. But even, even when you, so when you go to the doctor's office, they have this room that you sit in called the what? the waiting room. I mean, I mean, you get there on time and you still have to wait. Wait, wait, wait. I think we should make a button. You know the Staples says, uh, what's that button that Staples says? Yes. Yeah, we should have a button that says, wait, wait. So anyways, um, sorry. So, uh, but I discovered, so they tried to trick me one day. Let me get back to my story. They tried to trick me one day. They redesigned that office area. They added an extra space. Uh, the cardiologist I go to is in Weymouth, and there's like seven or eight of them in that office area. And, and so, uh, so I walked in there one time, and everything was changed. And, uh, and, and they had this sign that said, reception area. I'm thinking, you can't fool me. This is still the waiting room. Never mind reception area. This is still the waiting room. So anyway, so you're sitting there. So this is, this is a cool thing to try. You're sitting there. And as you're sitting there, the nurse comes to the door, and he or she opens the door, and what do they do? They call a name, right? So I don't know anyone who's there except myself, and even then I'm not sure about myself, but I don't know anyone who's there in the reception area. But all of a sudden, someone opens the door and says, you know, uh, Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones, or, or Harry, or, you know, you know, Jackie, or, you know, Julie, or whatever, and all of a sudden, I see someone stand up. You know, I'm not that smart, but I knew when someone stood up and when they called Julie that she was who? Yeah. I thought, hey, I'm going to stop praying for Julie. I mean, I know Julie's there because she has a heart issue. She's not there for a foot. She's not there for an ear. She's there for a heart because it's a cardiologist's office and anyone who goes there goes because they have issues with their yeah, you see how easy that is? So I started, so this is great. So now I want to get to the reception area a half an hour ahead of time so I can listen to the people because I know my doctor's never ready for me on the regular time, never mind a half an hour before, so I can listen to the names of the people they're going to call. So it's, it's great. Now, I don't write their names. I probably should, but I'll get my phone out. You know, you have that note app, you know, so I'll put the note in there and I'll start praying. It's great. I mean, I don't stand up and say, oh, God, as Julie's going in to see the doctor, I pray that you will watch her and keep her. And 
I mean, that will empty the waiting room, a reception area, <laughs> like that. But it's an awesome thing. So I'll stop, and his, his, it, this is what it'll do. It begins to help you develop a sensitivity to the leadership of the Spirit. I am telling you, I am telling you, even though you may not know that person's name, when you stop praying for that person, the Spirit of God will begin to talk to you, not necessarily about specific areas, but the Spirit of God will start ministering to you about that particular person. I mean, try it in school. I'm not saying try it in the middle of a class, but, but try it in school or try it where you work or, or wherever you are. Begin to pray. I could tell you stories and I don't have time. Um, I, so I started writing down different prayer experiments. And uh, so, you know, how you can buy those T-shirts that have colleges on them, you know. I have a bunch of ENC. I mean, I pray for T- ENC all the time. But, uh, but I, so I thought, you know, so I have a T-shirt that said North Carolina because it was on sale, not because I care about the school, but because it was on sale. Always go for the sale, right? So, so whenever I start wearing that T-shirt, I'll start praying for North Carolina. I'll start praying. For, I don't know anyone who goes to North Carolina University. Do you? I don't know anyone who's going there. But so I, and I don't have to pray specifically. But I'll say, okay, God, um, I don't know what's going on there, so I'll pray for North Carolina. One time it was Miami. Um, Boston College. I mean, you know, whatever college. Now, I don't do the pros because after New England, it's just New England. So I don't... You know, but uh, so, I, so I just stop praying. And, and you, you'll be amazed every once in a while, something that I'll read or there'll be an article about something going on at that college or that school. Is it because I'm praying that the article was written? No, it's because I've been sensitive to the leadership of the Spirit. You should do that. I mean, pray for singers, pray for actors, pray for people you have to pay your bills to. I mean, pray, I mean, start, just start praying for people and look how your sensitivity uh, will be changed and, and it'll be deepened. And that happens when you develop a deeper walk in the word and in prayer. Paul says in Colossians 4.2, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. The word devote yourself to prayer, I mean, not just devote yourself to prayer, but devote yourself to the results of being devoted to prayer. So that's encouragement number two. Deepen, begin to deepen your sensitivity to the Spirit. And it doesn't matter how old or how young you are. It doesn't matter how long you've been walking with Christ. You can be walking with Christ for a long time or a short time. Begin to do that. You'll see what happens. Encouragement number three. How many do I have? This is the last one. Look at the person next to you and say, wait, wait, wait. Encouragement number three. Ready? Um, become involved in the story of this congregation. Become involved in the story of this congregation. The story of this congregation began a long time ago and it continues and God is calling you to be involved in the story of this. God is writing some incredible, and you're part of that. You know some of the stories of this congregation. You've been a part of that. God is writing some incredible stories about this congregation even now, even today, and you're part of it. So I just want to encourage you to be involved in that. Stay engaged. This is part of the community. Don't quit. Don't, don't walk away. It'll be different. It will be different. Yes, it will. But be involved. Be involved in worship. Be involved in giving. Be involved in a small group or a Sunday school or Alpha, the Alpha group, or, or be involved in the assessment. Be involved in the basketball thing. What an incredible thing to do. You see how God's timing works, all of that? Be a blessing. Don't wait for someone to be a blessing to you. You be a blessing to them. Simeon took the baby Jesus in his arms and praised God and blessed them. Anna, coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and blessed them. Be a blesser. Be an encourager. Pray for names of your, pray for the name of your leaders, those who are on the worship team, those who are teaching a class, those who are doing a small group. 
I mean, encourage those who are taking the offering or encourage those who are working the sound or the PowerPoint or, or uh, the, what's not called PowerPoint, whatever it is called now. It's you know, how old I am. I mean, you pray for people who are involved. If, if the teens are involved, pray for them, encourage them. Say you did a good job. You did a, a wonderful. I love the way you sang. Like when they hit Emmanuel this morning. That was incredible. And I just want, now I'm probably not going to have a chance to say this afterwards. That's why I wanted to say it in the service. They did a phenomenal job hitting those notes that was amazing I encourage the people who are doing the kids because right now they're saying or is this speaker going to be done soon or not because it's time for the parents to come and pick up their kids pray pray for the parents i mean pray for everyone start walking around praying for people encourage them andrea you're doing a great job jenny you've done megan you rock you know those kinds of things you just start encouraging people and and be a blessing amen I think that was Andrea clapping. That was... <laughs> now, listen, I know that no one is perfect. I know the person sitting next to you is not perfect. I mean, you've known that for a long time, maybe, but they're just kind of getting, oh, yeah, that's right. I know we all have flaws. I know there are areas in our life that we are asking God to help us with. So we're all part of this community. We're in this together. And I want to encourage you to be an encourager. So in this time of transition, let's help one another. Let's encourage one another. In fact, we're going to sing a song about that. The worship team is coming back up. As I begin to wrap this up, uh, let us ask, listen, let us ask, the Spirit of God, to breathe on his church. That's this church. Let us ask the Spirit of God to pour out his presence, to speak through his word. We're going to sing a song that has these very lyrics, a powerful song, a beautiful song. And here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm not asking you to give money. I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm just asking you this morning, as we begin to journey into this process, if you will just simply come so we can have a closing time of prayer together. I mean, you just, you just walk up the aisle, wherever you are, and just kind of, I mean, you can kneel if you want. I'm just going to stand. Uh, you can come and stand. We're going to sing. And as we sing, I'm just going to ask you to come and stand. I want to have a closing time of prayer with you. Ask God to help encourage you to be the people of God he has called you to become. They're going to sing. Let's come. Let's come.